we're happy to have Kenneth Sun, Chief Strategy Officer of Riverwood Private Limited, and Elson Sam, a final year student from Nanyang Technological University, to share their experiences from taking the road less traveled. Let's give a round of applause to Kenneth and Elson, please. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for making time today. So uh, we have some prompt questions. That I'd just like to answer them in sequence and, and share a bit about my experience in China. So just a self-introduction. Um, my name is Elston, and I'm a final year student from Nanyang Technological University. So I just got back from China, Beijing. Um, I spent the whole of 2017 in China. So what I did there was I took one year off to do an exchange program in Peking University in Beijing. And then I also did two internships in China. The first one being in Jumei.com, which is an online e-commerce marketplace which sells beauty products and healthcare products. Not really something that I know much about before that. And then I spent the next six months at uh, Airbnb. And then when I got back, I did an internship at Grab. And now I'm just finishing up my studies. So I think the main thing that I like to share, like the four main takeaways that I had in China was that firstly, number one, like I'm someone who's really interested in, in tech, in, all, in apps, in tech industry. So for one, I really got to learn a lot about the tech industry there, seeing the whole landscape, not just um, using them by myself, but like attending talks, networking sessions, taking part in hackathons, um, meeting people, meeting founders there, going to meet people from VCs there. So just being able to soak in the whole experience of the tech industry there was, was really very enriching. Number two was my internship experience. So my first internship in Jimei.com, which is, a, is, an, is an online app, right? But I, I can just buy, imagine it's like Amazon or Taobao. So that was my, actually my first internship in a tech company. So I never knew any of the tech jargons, like click-through rates or, or, or all this, or the upper funnel analysis, lower funnel analysis. I never knew any of this. So the first time when I had to learn all of this was in Mandarin. So I spent the first two weeks on Baidu Translate every day, trying to understand what my colleagues were saying. So that was quite fun for the first two weeks. And then after that, um, the third thing I would share is my experience in Peking University. So Peking University, um, I'm not sure if most of you have heard of it. it it's, a, it's quite a renowned school in Beijing. So every year, around 9 million students take part in the Kao Kao, which is the exam. And roughly around 10,000 students actually get into the, ex in, into the school. So effectively, that's around 0.1%, 0.01 acceptance rate. So just being able to interact with the students there, um, know how they think, know about the ambition, and be able to sit in the classes that these like, really good teachers teach, that was really eye-opening. And to see the breed of students there compared to my peers in Singapore, that was very different for me as well. So I think one last thing for me was being able to live there. Of course, like, I did my fair bit of traveling, so just being able to, to travel and, and meet the people there was really nice. But the main thing was being able to live like local there for one year. So I eat the same food. I, I talk the same language. I travel the same way that they do. So that was really an eye-opening experience. So for me, when I told my friends and my family that I was going to China, most of them asked me, are you, are you crazy? Like, why do you want to go to China? As a student, all of us have to go on, uh, most of us will go on exchange programs. Most of us go to the US, Europe, even in Asia, maybe Taiwan. I've not heard of anyone who went to China before. So when my friends found out about it, they were quite intrigued. So, so why China? So my main objective was because like, I wanted to have a comparative advantage at every, every stage of my life. So the reason why I chose China is because I felt that at that time, two years ago, I still had something to offer. I had Western influences. I understood how the Western apps are, which a local company in China might not have that much exposure to. So I felt that I could bring some value there. And I felt that when I come back, Having one year of work experience in China, I could have some comparative advantage over my peers back in Singapore. So that's my whole thought process about, about going there. And I don't think I ever looked back. When I was there, it definitely opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, when I was in my first company at Jimmy.com, which is a Chinese e-commerce, I would manage to sit in to investor meetings because the investors were from Israel, from UK. So just because um, of, my, of my language capability, proficiency in English, they invited me along which is way above my job scope. Um, at Airbnb, it was super interesting as well because um, Airbnb in China was, was really young. So they only started up like around one year. So it worked like a startup, but they have really big resources supporting them. But the main point is that just being able to work 
work there and interact with them and, and think about how they think. It was a really enriching experience for me. First six months being in an all Chinese company, I'm the only foreigner there. To the next six months where all of those, all of them in Airbnb was local Chinese, but they all were Western educated. So it was like a nice blend of, of people and also to, to see how they think and how they do work. So that was my rationale for going um, overseas to China. Um, so one common question that the Singaporean community there always talked about was, like, what advantage do we really have going to China? I think maybe the, the older crowd would agree that maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe bilingual, being bilingual was quite an advantage, being able to speak well in Mandarin and English. But to be honest, most of them, most of them when we gather there, we ask ourselves, is that really still an advantage? Because what they call the haikui, so those are people who study abroad and come back to China. Do we really have an advantage over them? Because their profi English proficiency is almost as good as already. So what real advantage do we have? So sometimes like, we really doubt ourselves, like, what can we really bring to the table? But I think a common recurring value that, that comes out is being trustworthy. Singapore has a really good image in China. When I go to the shopping malls and they look at me and when, when I reply them in Mandarin, they are, they, are, they are quite shocked and they ask me where I'm from. Or I'm saying, oh, oh, Singaporeans can speak Chinese? Or like, oh, where's Singapore? I didn't know you could speak Mandarin. So I think that we really have a really good reputation there. So I think what, what maybe Kenneth would address more of working there as an as, as a adult in, in mid-career. But maybe for me as a young graduate, someone who's starting a career, I would definitely urge like the younger, um, those who are just starting to work or just start uh, or in the mid career of their life that to consider China. I mean, besides the language barrier, which is something that you can definitely um, work on, there, there are a lot of opportunities there. So I like to break the, um, the themes of opportunities in, in two ways. For one, personal development. When I was in China, I was exposed to a lot of talks, a lot of events. It was not hard to fill my week up with, with events or talks or workshops or, or hackathons. And because I'm sure you've heard of WeChat, right? So WeChat is really more than just like WhatsApp. It's a whole ecosystem. So people pull you to random group chats. They send you invitations to different events. So it's really easy to, to get connected and meet people from different backgrounds. When I was there in China, I met some really cool people. I met Bill Gates. I went for a talk. I met Romano Prodi, who was the ex-Italian PM. I also met Thomas Friedman, who was a three times Pulitzer Prize winner. So that was a real eye-opener for me because I, I never thought, I never imagined my life that I could see someone so successful and hear them speak. So that was very empowering for me. Besides the personal development side, maybe I can share a bit about the career side for, for those who are maybe thinking of like working abroad. So I think that the English speaking community in China is, is quite closely knit, especially in Beijing and Shanghai. So in group chats, it's always very common for them to just post job, um, job search or like job offers. Just imagine in Singapore, in a WhatsApp group, people just send or oh, looking for um, this, this type of caliber um, of person with how many years of experience, kind of thing. So it's really common for, that, for, for them to find internships, for them to find um, full-time applicants. So I think the opportunities are, are not short when you're there. So I think the main question would, like, would be, how can someone in Singapore start on their journey to, to want to work in China? So I think for one, Ion Asia is definitely a good platform. They did not ask me to say this, but I'm just sharing. <laughs> yeah, but besides um, allowing us to find out more about how it is out there, I think there are a lot of resources that Ion Asia actually has, and some governmental bodies, um, schools, they offer overseas internships. And maybe for those who are wanting to find like a midterm career switch to China, um, I, I'm sure like Kenneth and myself is more than willing to help to bridge um, the dots here. Because there are a lot of um, communities that I've managed to be associated with there. And they are more than willing to help to bring Singaporeans over. Not only, not, not for the sake of anything, but just to sh share with Singaporeans about their experience and show them that Actually, it could be really enriching to, to go overseas. Yeah, so that's my basic sharing. Um, I think maybe as you all listen to Kenneth afterwards, maybe you have more questions and then I could answer them for you. Yeah, thank you. 
my name is Kenneth. Uh, okay, I okay for a start. I am with Riverwood. So Riverwood, uh, we are in logistics and supply chain. We are the Amazon Prime in Singapore at B two C level. At B two B, we are the local partner. As the the big boys change the model of how they work, we that means meaning your, your guys are your DHL, your your this uh, TNT, your Federal Express as they retain their ocean freight, their air freight. Uh, a lot of them now, uh, for cost effectivity, they will change the model to having uh, local partnership dish out to the guys in the, on the underground. So we, for us right now at the B two B level, we are uh, DHL, uh, TNT, and also Better Express. Uh, in a nutshell, I spent 15 years. Uh, in, if you count this year, I, I'm 15 years in China already. I started my career. Uh, I'm an economist by training. I that was about 2003, 2004, I believe. I Started my career in Solomon Speed Money. Then uh, quite quickly what happened was actually a family office got me out into China and uh, an establishment family office. So uh, what happened next, of course, I was thrown into the ocean. I was told to put aside all my books. Uh, and it didn't help matters when I, I speak English at home. So I, the Chinese, that I, the Mandarin I speak today, uh, I, I don't think it's the way I, I would have imagined. So... Uh, it was tough at first when I went in because most of the guys out there uh, who went in and during the when the doors were open in the from the late 80s to the 90s, uh, I think they had it tough going. Okay. Uh, but the time that I went in, I think was when the the Chinese government started to make changes. China arguably is the only uh, civilization, if you put it, if you talk about the Chinese civilization, is the only one that never ceased to go away. The Romans, the Ottomans, the everybody else. Okay, you want to bring in the, the Mongols, everybody have gone. But there is a reason. And as an economist, as a macroeconomist, I strongly believe uh, economic history is tied to it. So meaning even if today, or you, let's say in the past, even if Deng Xiaoping did not open the doors, did not identify Shanghai or Shenzhen or any one of them, they will still make good because they already in the past, they were already successful. As an example, so if you go to China, places like those with a Zhou behind. So whether is it Fu Zhou, you know, your this uh, Su Zhou, your your this uh, Hang Zhou, all these easily are uh, we're talking about easily about thousand over to two thousand over years. So meaning traditionally, if you bring Shanghai as well into picture, they already been trading, they already been open up to the Far East already for the longest time. So meaning even if you don't have the government intervention, you go there sooner or later they will they will also be able to get some, they also will make it as well. So uh, for China. Uh, for those guys who went in early, it wasn't easy. I say that because a lot of, uh, you hear of, I'm sure, a lot of stories of the Singaporeans, the Malaysians, the guys from ASEAN who have gone there to do business, to do work. Uh, what Elson mentioned earlier was very true. I mean, in the past, when uh, the notion of what he mentioned earlier, Hai Kui, Hai Kui or Sea Turtle, uh, loosely translated, uh, meant people like us from Southeast Asia. But today's Hai Kui is no longer us are the mainland Chinese who have gone out and gone back. And exactly like he pointed out, they speak better than us, right? And then uh, they, they obviously, their Chinese will be way better than us. And they have this familiarity that the mainland Chinese can associate with. But one thing I want to, uh, as a form of encouragement to uh, everybody here, whether you, you know, like what I mentioned, uh, whether you want to pursue an opportunity in China or whether you want to go there to seek a job, or even just to look around and see whether there's an opportunity. I want to tell you, China, every single place, uh, minus Qinghai and Gansu, every single place in China I've been to, right? So you're talking about Xinjiang, Neymeng, you know, to your Ningxia, for the Muslims, to the, your eastern side of China, your, what's that, your, 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 your Heilongjiang. Every part of China today is open for everyone. And I say that because if you, in the past, I mean, I, 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 I mean, there are quite a lot of seniors here, uh, which can relate to this. Imagine if in the past when Wei Chou Yao and Lenin Chao were to probably, if Wei Chou Yao want to take, uh, want to do a, you know, probably an acquisition of his, of his company, he'll probably do it over a very friendly manner, maybe over a meal. But today, and I say that, uh, especially with a lot of millennials, for example, like yourself, uh, I, I mentioned this to the Chinese government. Um, we have to look out for the people who are the Pa Ling Ho and the Chiu Ling Ho. Okay? So we are talking about the millennials essentially. So why? A, when, when the Singaporeans, the other day when I was having another talk as well and, at SUTD, and that's where 
they there were there were a lot of locals and I said the Singaporeans are not hungry and they obviously fantui lah they weren't happy about it lah. But I told them you have to understand this. We were comfortable or we are comfortable for the longest time, right? And the mainland Chinese in the past before the mainland Chinese we talk about the Hong Kongers, the Hongkies we talk about. They are hungry. You look at Hong Kong. Why does it pay so fast? Everybody's fighting for a chance. Even a guy who does the furniture for IKEA, if you get him to do a cupboard, forty-five minutes. One guy so petite size, don't know how he carried the thing up in the first place, but he does it up in forty-five minutes. Hours, two, three guys carry up one and a half hours. You can see everybody the desire. So in China, today, what's happened from days of Wei Chou Yao and Lin Ning Chao and today's mainland China. Uh, I say this because I think everybody genuinely has a chance. Whether you are working or whether you are seeking for an opportunity, uh, we are talking about a Chinese market that is accessible to all of us. So when in the past I say that when you say you are championing China, maybe we are talking about mainland Chinese, and maybe we the Forbes 100 in China today will only be applicable, or maybe in the past will be applicable only to the mainland Chinese. But today, no. In a connected world that we are in today. I was just telling a few guys the other day. In the past, you can set up a company with Acra. You take your time to do. You keep it dormant. Also, doesn't matter. You probably after two years, you can still get a company life. But today, you the moment you go and register the company, you better think global. You don't have a choice, right? With the social media that's accessible to everybody now, with everybody now, you see information is readily at our doorstep. Let's bring our attention back to China. Meaning now, even if in Singapore today, even if you're not in China, but you make China your market, that is what I mean. Tomorrow's FOP 100 China can be any one of you here, can be any one of us. Because why? Anyone in the past, I will never be thinking of in today. I'm sure a lot of us here will be talking,、uh, using a lot of social media, Instagram, LinkedIn. Example, like for me, I use a lot of LinkedIn. Even I have a cousin who is,、uh, what's that? A telecom, talent acquisition、uh, hire. So she she is a head hunter. And she tells me, I, you say, can you can I, I'm comfortable to just do my acquisition、uh, internally, and in this case, she's with a hospitality group. So she said, in, there are internal transfers that people want to. I will seek from LinkedIn, but and if there are guys outside of the, I can't find them within the group because sometimes you also must find the right profile. If I can't find them within the group, I find them outside the group, but within LinkedIn. So what I'm trying to say here, even in just a platform or a marketplace, whatever you call this thing. All of us genuinely today are so easily connected to anyone. In the past, when I would never think of going Africa, I still do not know where I'll still go Africa. But imagine now talk about China, which I've been spending 15 years already, and I still say this: 15 years today, I'm still as hungry in terms of wanting to understand China more because of my inability to master my language then, because I didn't like it. I I remember whenever there was a Chinese class, I would always try to siam and go go out of the class, but. How funny! How how life will, will pan out. And where I spent six months, the family office got a equivalent of a sort of a vice mayor.、Uh, there's this function in the government called、uh, Chao Lian. It's actually set up by、uh, something good for all of us. You know, it's set up by Tangkaki actually. So as how governments will do it, the if you have a Chao Lian that's set up by in this case a, pers- a private person. So the government. So this also applies to all of you. If tomorrow you will go to any city, whether you are in Guangdong or you are in Guangxi or even if you are in Shanghai, anywhere, or even in in this case in the west,、uh, northwest of China, you just go look for the government. Just go look for this function called Chao Lian or All China Federation for Overseas Chinese, which I'm also sitting on the the federation as well. And the government, you can even look for this Chao Lian, okay, the abbreviation of Chao Lian or Chao Ban. Chao Ban is set up by Chinese central government, and as how they will also do it lah. Since there's one more thing called party, right? So party will call Tong Zan Bu. So if you can't find him, you can't find him. You go find Tong Zan Bu. All three guys, and I think China is not difficult to master, not difficult to understand. A lot of times, I think when we go to any country, whether you are going to Indonesia, people say, "Oh, I don't understand Bahasa Indonesia." Ah,、uh, after speaking Hi Bapa, I don't know how to carry on with it. So the question here is, it's not about that. What we do transcends the language, transcends the culture. More importantly, is your your willingness to wanting to engage the, the the people. So in this case, it's first to understand guys on the ground. So for a start, see we we go top down. Is we we look at Beijing first. Xi Jinping, or in the past was Hu Jintao. In during Hu Jintao's time, the administration or the Politburo, the political bureau, uh, they, you have nine of them, right? So today there's only seven, 
So whether it's seven or nine, it doesn't matter. But these seven of them, you look, let's look at Xi Jinping first. All these will be replicated all the way down to district level minus the village. Okay, so district, you have county, you have city. City or two types of city. So when you hear, you see the, the, the business card, if you see the A, if you see the, the person's title called Fu Shi Zhang, it's vice mayor, right? But when you cheng hu, when you address the person, when the person sees you or the, you, you meet the vice mayor, the vice mayor doesn't address himself as vice mayor. He just calls himself Shi Zhang. So every joker out there, all of my friends, hey, I met a mayor. Everyone sees he met a mayor. I say, can't be so many mayors, right? So that comes the next question. Yes, there are mayors, but every city on average, so let's assume China on average has about, let's say, 28 to 30 provinces. And let's break down that somehow you can have another, let's say, another again, 20 to 40 over against cities. And there's another type of city called, uh, what is that, county level city. What's a good example? In Singapore, we can all relate to, so we have your Fuzhou people. We have your Fuqing people as well. So Fuqing is a subset of Fuzhou. But because of the importance of Fuqing, the GDP numbers that Fuqing is deriving for Fuzhou, the political capital of Fuqian, that is, they are given Fuqing, the county level city. Right? So they are also called a uh, shi. And so in this case, the mayor is also called shi zhang. But in this case, you, you only realize that he's actually a county level mayor. But it just doesn't matter. But what I'm trying to tell you is that in every... Everyone is the same. The structure is the same. It doesn't change. So it's not difficult. If you try to comprehend, why wow, I meet this guy, I meet that guy, who should I talk to? It's important. So Xi Jinping, in the eyes of the outside world, is president. To the mainland Chinese, it is the Zhong Su Ji, which is the chief party secretary, right? So chief party secretary, the order is like this. It's four simple structures, four simple organs. The party... People's Congress. So every March or April, you have the People's Congress. If for people who are seeking opportunities, who are seeking jobs, you might want to pay attention to the China News Asia or, or maybe go on to maybe uh, CCTV or whatever to pay attention to what's being said during the March, April. And maybe go to even maybe to the various ministries or even to the Ministry of Trade in China to understand. Because that's a time when uh, taxes are being paid, submitted to Beijing, and they will dispense it back. So you give first before they will distribute it back. So they get subsidies or not. And second, they will identify, for example, maybe Shanghai this year, you focus on, okay, maybe technology or bio. Uh, in, let's say in Guangxi's case, which I'm sitting on Guangxi as well. So Guangxi, early days in 2007, your focus was on sugarcane. They are sugarcane plantation. So sugarcane, you have Thailand, you have Philippines. So in this case, China's southern, southwest corridor of this uh, Guangxi is a very important sugarcane province. So today, they probably say, okay, maybe in 2008, 2009, they said, okay, you should focus on producing paper. Or oh, that's considered quite backward. Lah, because many people have done paper already, with, even with sugar. So this is what I'm trying to say. If you are seeking for opportunity, just stay close to what they are trying to tell you. The structure is very simple to understand. People's Congress, really, the third one is called government. And that's where you have Yi Ke Qiang. Then you have the fourth guy, which is the CPPCC, China's Political Consultative Conference. Right? So, but when it comes to the internal structure, in the outside world, it will be one, three, two, four. When they will, you see, sometimes you find that there are unfamiliar guys you don't, you never seen before. How come that guy is also with shaking hand with Trump? Ah, that's the guy I'm talking about. He is that People's Congress chairman. So, example now, and this is something uh, I have to give it to the Chinese, where they, where they pay a lot of attention to Li uh, Yi, to tradition, right, to etiquette. So, meaning to, just I remember years ago in 2009, I invited this person. I actually know who he is because I was uh, working very closely with the Thai government. And that's where I invited this person called Wu Tai Pin Jai Chon. And Wu Tai Pin Jai Chon, so when I, I submitted it to, in this case it was Guangxi, because I wanted him to go take a look. Because in order for a place to open up, first you must connect the two flights. So the two, for the two flights to happen, I need to talk to the two airport authorities. So for the two, as long as these two are connected, when you have tourism, once a flight comes in, I will have tourism. Once tourism comes in, business will flow. Foreign investments will come in. So, I invited this one guy. So the in when it's outside of uh, the government of the central government is con, is called in China in is called uh, ministry of course in Beijing, but at the provincial level is considered Tingji, which is just a department, foreign office. So the foreign office, uh, I remember the head actually told me, "Hey, uh, Sun Xianzheng, we cannot take this man. I say, I say, he said we cannot we, we cannot uh, we cannot dispense with uh, formality." So what do you mean? Actually, I know, you know. But, so I say, uh, so what have you found out? He said, oh, I still remember that time was uh, Madam Wu Yi, if you guys, uh, the more senior ones still remember. So the Deputy Prime Minister. So 
uh, the women pri deputy prime ministers actually told uh, specifically to the head of uh, foreign office of Guangxi and said, uh, this guy is the equivalent of, uh, you say you must get the party secretary or the governor, not the mayor, the city mayor, not in this case, not Nanning, which is a political capital, or the party secretary of Nanning to come out. You must get the Guangxi guy to come out. Then I say, why? Why, 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 why the fuss? He said, oh, because this guy, so what I'm trying to tell you is that China can check anything. So for those guys who have lost family members, you can also find out. Okay, they can trace anybody. Okay, so they actually found out that this guy, uh, oh, he's a, he says, 相对是这个人大主席. So it's the equivalent of the, uh, what's that, the uh, People's Congress Chairman. Because he is, uh, or he was the former uh, Senate Chairman of Thailand and the former Minister of Commerce. And they added one more, but by the way, he's Hainanese also. I say, okay, so that helps. So the, what I'm trying to tell you here is that China is not difficult to understand. It's a lot of times, it's we, I think we overthink the situation. Some, that's why I think that's the Hokkien saying, uh, really, I think it really it plays a lot. Because a lot of times when you conjure up something, it's an assumption. You don't even understand this market much less even done anything in there. So why, why, why conceive something you don't, you, you know, without having anything? So what I'm trying to tell you here is that China, uh, I say this to, in a way, is, is in, uh, to encourage all of you as well. Uh, the Chinese actually welcome all, exactly like what he pointed out earlier. Uh, Singaporeans in the eyes of the Chinese uh, are actually valued. Okay, uh, even I include the greater uh, ASEAN as a whole. Southeast Asia, uh, in the eyes of China, are uh, like family, okay? But of course, if you want to bring back the Hai Kui he mentioned earlier, the sea turtles today, the mainland Chinese, then of course, they are a tad better because they are kaki nang, right? more familiar, right? Because they are also mainland Chinese. It's the same, but what I'm trying to encourage you is if you are back in China, don't uh, just, be, just, be, just, be, just be candid, just be genuine. Just like for me, I told them, if I were to tell you now, I regard China as motherland, uh, I'll be lying to you. But that doesn't stop me from having a, the relationship that we have. Because why? My ancestors came from there. I'm a Teochew from Swatow. I'm from Teo An. But and that's where I said, uh, this relationship uh, doesn't change anything for us. But what I seek to do here is because going forward, I know what I want to do with China. So what I'm trying to tell you here is to implore on all of you is that if you, whether is it that you have a xiangfa, whether you have, you have something that you conceive, whether is it an idea, or whether is it or, or you have a business that you think you can take on the Chinese market, if, especially more so if you're in retail, okay? Uh, retail market is totally open for everybody. Uh, in China's case, very simple, just like any country, like, not just about China, but always the spotlight is always on China. As long as anything centers on national security, huh? what is national security? In the eyes of everybody, even same for US also, right? So anything to do with your telecommunication assets. So you are in telco space. If you are in your, what is that, your infrastructure. So meaning if you are in the guy who owns the rail, or you hope that to do the rail business, and I'm telling you now, it's quite unlikely. So if you, if, I, if you talk about banking and finance, if you remember the last administration, that means in fact two administrations ago, at the tail end of the Bush administration, Henry Paulson, okay, the finance minister, or the finance secretary, actually managed to lobby for US in this case, lobbied for Goldman Sachs. Uh, what is that? The uh, securities license. Okay, what I'm trying to say just now is that after so long, they never released any license. So who? They actually gave out two. They gave out to UBS and they gave out to Goldman Sachs. In my personal opinion, uh, I, I actually think UBS was the fortunate one. This is my personal opinion. Because why? You cannot give one person. You got to give two. Because Goldman Sachs in the, in the history of time is always closely tied to the Federal Reserve. You don't have to think Beijing. Every one of us is natural. When you think something, you think of wanting to go to the capital, for sure. And that's the first place you want to go to. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. China, firstly, arguably is the only place in the world that can afford to recluse itself. If they shut their doors, but all of us outside are behaving as though we need, we, they need us rather than we need them. They do not need us. Okay, but some facts and figures for you. Uh, I've appeared who has gone from Goldman Sachs uh, back to CIC already. So CIC is equivalent of GIC for China. And just as late as maybe about two, three years ago, she told me every three weeks to six weeks, the, the amount of money that goes into the coffers to the reserves in USD is 1.3 to $6.2 billion. So 
I had a conversation during that time, incidentally, with uh, Wang Zijun, the uh, MD of uh, PetroChina. So I said, Wang Zhong, do you think you So he told me, he literally said, we are going shopping. So that's basically m and But what I want to add on to what I said earlier about the, the millennials today, I'm trying to tell you now, m and will be the buzzword going forward for any one of us. Whether we like it or we don't like it, in the past, we can hold a sole proprietorship for the longest time, nobody will touch you. Today, whether you're doing it for the sake of maybe this guy just want to come to Singapore or whatever. Lah. Maybe he's not interested in your business. Or maybe for a good reason why the way going forward to grow fast is to acquire, is to merge. But today, the distinction will be, the difference will be, this, all this will be done in a very hostile manner. Because why? One child policy. What I'm trying to tell you is that A, it doesn't help matters that this is an aging population. All of us are in this region are all aging population, but only Indonesia and not too far away, we have India, which are all young population. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this market, I mean, I was in the ASEAN summit recently, not too long ago, a few months ago, and that's where in the history of time, and that's important for all of you to take note, whoever innovates wins. So whether you are a company trying to break through, to evolve, or whether you are a country trying to come up with your next best thing, you must have that USP, that unique selling point. The moment you innovate, you control. Same like if I bring back a long, long time ago, for the older folks, you remember Emerald Cheng Ho when it came down. That certainly changed in large parts, even this region also, because of the people that he brought down, the, the, you know, and everything that obviously he influenced. But what happened after he, the emperor did not support him? We never saw China in the naval space again. And that allowed for people like your East India Company, your Dutch East India Company, or your Holland, your Spain, your Portugal to become naval powers. Does that mean that China wasn't? It's just that they, 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 were made, they didn't have a choice. So what I'm trying to tell you is that when they innovated back then, they were had arguably some of the biggest ships. And I heard at the time, it was some, as big as aircraft carriers today. Where they put, they had livestock, they, have, they were growing vegetables and growing all kinds of things on, on board. And if we go back some more, when China innovated, came out with paper, with gunpowder, they controlled that time of the era. And if we bring back to, to, to re recent times, when, um, we, when we had the war, when America came out with the atomic bomb, of course nobody wanted it. So what I'm trying to tell you is whoever innovates something, will win the game going forward. One thing that I want to tell you now is you do not have time. If you are going to do it, come up with an execution plan. Make it happen. Even just the other day, I was having this at SUTD, I was having this guy, this, this uh, mentee of mine. I was telling him, you arguably may have the best innovation right now, arguably. And you may just win yourself an award and you may just be able to get yourself in and a whole load of investors. But to get into the market, the get-to-market plan is not to wait until your product is done. You don't have time. Because the world is too connected already. I, I was telling him, I'm sitting on East China University of Science and Technology as an, on, an investment committee. East China U Science or U University of Science and Technology, EUST, is the algamation of, in the past, the Jiangsu, Zhejiang, as, and Shanghai Science and Technology Universities. And they arguably in the world, they have uh, 2,500 yen jiu sheng. They have 2,500 researchers. And these are the guys who came up with the stealth fighter coating. So imagine now, I just have to bring a few guys from the different faculty. Trust me, given time. That's exactly what I'm trying to tell my mentee. You don't need a fully cooked product to go into the market. As long as this thing is functional, you get in ready. It serves the purpose of the market. What you're trying to do is to perfect your product. This is not a painting, right? Painting, you can take your time and draw. The question here is the market right now is ready. They are, they are really hungry for something. So whether you are fulfilling a requirement or you think there is a demand for something that you can educate the market to take on, don't wait. If you are here in Singapore, why look so far away? This market alone, as much as it's aging, feed the aging guys with something, right? The young also need something, right? The Indonesian market, the Indian market. This population, China and ASEAN combined, is going to be the world's biggest population, right? What is China trying to do? Put politics aside. Everyone has politics. All we have to do is just stay out of the political equation. The global economics has descended in one region, and that is China-ASEAN. I mean, it's, I think everyone understands 
everything has got challenges, everything has got opportunity. But it's important to take note that if we embrace it with not just knowing, but taking it on, wearing it, that I am challenged and opportunity ready. That means now, even whether I'm going to do a business or whether I'm going to take on a job tomorrow, I know uh, I'm going to suspect something might go wrong. I know uh, there might be a sangji, there might be an opportunity that awaits me. If you can do that, every one of us have a better chance than the guy who is still thinking, I know. Everything got challenges. Uh. Yeah, you know. So you're still dwelling on it. Whereas I will be working on it. So if you are one tad faster than the other, trust me, you, it doesn't mean that only the mainland Chinese got a chance. Uh. Mainland Chinese have chance because why? They are in the forefront of all the information overload uh, right now. They, don't, they may not have Google. That doesn't mean they cannot get to, to, to go Google. It's only how they get into Google, right? So can you imagine what are the Chinese doing today? They are just thinking of how to, to they are thinking of finesse, thinking of refinement, how to better the service, the experience. So same thing, even for Riverwood, we are going to China. That's certainly one key market we're going into. Earlier, you know, together with Shafiq, my partner Shafiq, we were, we were talking about halal as a standard. Qingzhen, if it's halal in Chinese, Qingzhen wei piaozhen. Because in the first place, I mean, to me, as a non-halal guy, right? Halal to me is when someone or in this group of people pays attention to the details. When you know that you don't want to compromise something. So if you can do that and if you can wear that on a macro level, same thing for business. So halal, what I'm trying to tell you is the same thing. Every one of us need to find and identify that one USP, the unique selling point. I've been doing halal since 2007. It is a painful process to do halal because it's expensive and it is an arduous process, it takes long. But does it mean going forward, nobody wants to do halal? No, everybody wants to do halal. And guess what? The halal market in Japan now is also an import market. But bringing this back to context, what I'm trying to tell you here is, it's not Japan's opportunity, it's not a halal opportunity I'm talking about, but it's where when everyone realizes what we are going into, same like when I told the Taiwan ambassador and the Vietnamese ambassador as well, every one of us have a genuine opportunity just like Japan. I told, I told the two ambassadors, I said, your excellencies, you are not in any way inferior or in a, in a bad situation. It just happened that he did it first. Would Japan know they will be in this predicament where they can embrace an opportunity like that? No. But what's in the, 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 this, this similarity that all of you have? All of you are traditional tourist destination. Not that the Muslims in the Middle East or anywhere in this region do not know that there's a Shinkansen, the bullet train, and the Disneyland, just that they never associated travel to that country. Same for Vietnam, same for Da Nang, Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi. So I told them, all of us genuinely have a chance. So like for us, how do we derive our USP? That's where with Taiwan and Vietnam, that's where we say, let's do a joint marketing effort. If we do a joint marketing effort, if I'm wearing halal, Halal is not halal, but halal as a standard. Riverwood, we also do kosher. So what I'm trying to tell you, whether you are the organic for your mummies that are paying attention to the kids' items, anything. The whole idea what I'm trying to tell everybody is that going forward, survival is tied to growth. Now that we are able to wear this halal as a standard, as, as this new uh, unique selling point, this USP properly, we can transcend. If we do the joint marketing effort, we need a use case. We need to go out to the market. We cannot be just talking about halal all the time. And when we do that, and for them, they need to have someone to let them know, don't fear us. And let's talk about Vietnam. So I, I told the Excellency, I said, imagine now if let me, let Riverwood help you carry a certain item, let's say a pharmaceutical, whether is it a medical device or, medi or medicine. When we do that, A, it's a win-win for you and me. People see a chance to understand Vietnam has a structure. Vietnam is serious about wanting to combat all these things about uncertainties. So when you have a Piao Zun, when you have a standard, Vietnam sees, oh, Riverwood, they don't compromise. Riverwood is also working with Singapore government. So the SG brand as a whole, with Riverwood pushing that USP, we go with them, they get their investment, starting with tourism, with more foreign investors coming in to employ an opportunity. Every one of us have a chance. It's only when you move out of your comfort zone, to go find out what is that one thing. So by doing so, what does it stand for Riverwood? So we can actually move our supply chain. Why? Because now we can move along the various parts of the value chain. We can transcend into a marketplace. We can do a lot of things. There are many verticals that we can create. Just now I mentioned about China identifying the chance into ASEAN. So if you see an opportunity with China this way, be excited. 
If you go this way, also be excited. Why? We, when this econ global economy is feeling tired, weary, and fatigued right now, China has got trade surpluses, right? So, where are they going to drop all these things, all these trade materials? ASEAN. So, let's say, assuming whether Singapore goes ahead with a project with Malaysia or not, that's secondary. Let's bring that high speed rail. Let's assume this high speed rail all the way down, okay, from Myanmar all the way down to Malaysia happens. There will be an EPC, there will be a main con that will get a job. So, if all of you, if the first thing, if I think along that line, whether I have some liquidity, I have some cash now, let's talk about doing business opportunity now. If it's me, I go identify all the points of where they are going to land in Malaysia, example. So, meaning all these places now, all these landing points that they're going to drop that station. If you see a hospitality opportunity, or you see whatever opportunity, or you see that guy going for the hospitality opportunity, it's not that he needs a five-star hotel, you don't need. This guy is just to transit and go. That could be a two-star, it could be a three-star, it could be a business hotel. And if I don't have that much money, but if this guy is going to create an opportunity, or maybe as we speak, there could be opportunities like this. And maybe I don't have the money to play hospitality, but I may want to just go in there and say, hey, I can provide linen. I can provide the order, you know, cutlery or whatever for this, this hotel. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there are plenty of opportunities. So for whoever, anyone who says there's no opportunity to do business outside, not true. It really depends. If you can't do sale, example for real estate, then do lease. When people feel yayi, when they feel, when they, when they feel times are tough, I can't buy, then I got to find the lease. And this is interesting to say this because even when we talk about real estate to sidetrack, in China as we speak, of course, people want to take ownership. But every one of them in China are migrant workers. Maybe you've identified an opportunity during the National Day like right now. So that's one, one week of golden holiday. In just that one week. So even if you think that one week of opportunity, the amount of people that's going to just go back home, I tell you, is scary. Uh, if you want to try sell something or you want to think of a service, I'm telling you now, there are plenty for you to think. In China, the only thing I would, I would uh, urge you to pay attention to is when it comes to IP, intellectual property, uh, be careful. I have this one guy, very interestingly, this guy's in the lighting business. And so for people who are in the lighting business, you go to the Milan show in Europe. In the past, mainland Chinese happily go in. So what happened in this real incident was all the big designers of lighting designers, all the expensive designers, this one joker went in, went obviously did whatever he needed to copy it and went back to, to Milan and gave him an offer. I say, hi, I'm, this, is, this is my offer for you. Either you work with me and I give you royalties. What do you mean by you give me royalties? I should be giving people royalties, right? In this case now, he's trying to tell him, it's either you work with me or I do it myself. Do it myself means you, I will be selling my lighting myself. What do you mean? Oh, I copy everything already. And interestingly, six months down the road, my friend had a lighting and he told me, this is And I tell you, it looked no different from the real one. So in the part, that's why the danger is they don't let the Chinese copy. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you are into anything that's proprietary, uh, where you will have to take care of your pattern rights, uh, pay attention to that. If you're in tech, maybe you want to put it pattern pending. Right? In some cases. And of course, if for Coca-Cola's case, it's a trade secret. Right? But I don't think a lot of people fall in that category. I think it's more of just either of which I mentioned earlier. So, uh, this is what I probably want to share for now. I think there's just so much to share because China is just a big place. I mean, I spent 15 years in China. So, yeah, I hope uh, it was helpful. <laughs>